One of the things that we're going to talk about throughout the entire retreat, we're going to think of things in terms of relationship. Uh, there is a, uh, as we understand relationships, which all that is, is it, speaking of personal relationships, individuals, uh, one person in relation to another. Those relationships can be, that, that's just sort of the neutral statement. Everybody's in relationship to each other. Those of you sitting next to each other right now are in a physical, spatial relationship to the person you're sitting next to. That's neither good nor bad. It's just what it is. Uh, we are in personal relationships with each other, marriage, friends, you know, parents to children, wh whatever, whatever it is. Going to confession, you're in the relationship with God through the priest of uh, penitent to God. Uh, so all of these things are relation, but relationships can also be bad. There can be relationships that are bad. St. Paul warns us if you have those sorts of relationships, get literally the hell away from them. Get away because you're threatening your eternal salvation. So we're going to be speaking of relationships as they keep presenting themselves to us throughout all of uh, Holy Week presented in sacred scripture. So today, Wednesday, is traditionally known as uh, Spy Wednesday, uh, which is the day the tradition and scriptures seem to reveal that uh, Judas went to the uh, Pharisees uh, and got his 30 pieces of silver. So relationships don't always, don't, excuse me, don't just exist uh, in terms of one person to another, the primary relationship a person has begins with the relationship to himself or to herself. So if you walk up to the altar uh, with your bride or groom and you say, I do, well, that implies you have some sort of mastery of yourself. Certainly hope. You know, you're saying, I do, you know, take you for my lawfully wedded, whatever, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, you have to have some sort of self-understanding to be able to say that. You know, when you say in the creed, like we said today at the beginning of the Holy Rosary, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, I believe, Holy Spirit, da, 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 et cetera. Well, that's an expression of how you understand yourself. That's where that comes from. How do I understand myself? How do I stand in relation to me? So the first person we're going to examine relationally uh, is Judas. Uh, Holy Week sort of begins with uh, the revelations about Judas. Obviously, we have Palm Sunday and the coming in and all of that, but I want to present to you here to sort of step into other people's shoes for a little bit as we go through Scripture. Uh, and I want you to consider as Catholics the vast importance of sacred Scripture, in particular the Gospels. Uh, St. Ignatius said that the... Uh, Ignorance of scriptures, I'm sorry, Saint, uh, uh, who translated the Gospels? Uh, the, Jerome, thank you. Uh, Saint Jerome, I screw saints up all the time. I know what they say, I just usually give wrong attributions left and right. Uh, Saint Jerome said, ignorance of scriptures is ignorance of Christ. I'd like you to make a few little points to yourself for when you leave the retreat. If you want to make them on the back page of the little notebooks you have in front of you, Every retreat is great, it's fine, it's wonderful. Oh, I went there, got a great, got our like demonic vaccine shot, Psh, there it is. Feeling great, going out and that's it, and then two days later, life is just normal again. Not only is the point of a retreat to pull away from the world and to sort of recharge, but it is to grow in holiness, to grow in sanctity, to go out into the world and be ready to meet it more of a warrior. So in order to do that, you have to sort of take a list of things away with you from a retreat. These are things I am now going to do. 
I learned about this on the retreat. I'm now going to incorporate it into my life and build from that. So one of the things, if you don't already do it, I highly, highly, highly encourage you in the strongest terms. Again, the church places an indulgence on this because it's so important. You should spend some minutes a day reading sacred scripture, in particular the Gospels. Say a little tiny prayer of your own making to the Holy Spirit immediately before you begin and open up whichever gospel you, you know, think is your favorite and then begin reading it and just read each little passage and look for the between the lines. We all know the facts of Holy Week, you know, Palm Sunday, this, Judas betrayed him, the garden, soldiers, blah, Pharisees, Pilate, crucifixion, resurrection, and we all know that. But if it was just that simple, there, there wouldn't be more ink spilled on the passion and resurrection of our blessed Lord than any other topic in human history. There's all kinds of depth and mystery here. And to meditate on this, you know, you, you, you pray to the Holy Spirit to enlighten you. You know, show me what this is here. And I'll give you one example. It isn't related to Holy Week specifically. Uh, you never see colors mentioned that much in Scripture, in the Gospels anyway. You, don't, you never really hear about color that much. The uh, Holy Spirit just never inspired the, the evangelists to use colors, only on a very small handful of occasions. For example, uh, the transfiguration. Uh, his countenance changed and his clothes were dazzling white. Purity. Uh, we hear the soldiers threw a purple cloak around him. That was to mock him because purple was the color of uh, uh, nobility and the, and the ruling, the emperor. There's one particular path, you would blow right over it if somebody didn't tell you about it or you didn't learn it from somewhere. Uh, when our Lord has all of, the, all of his followers out in the desert and the apostles come to him and they say, Master, you know, we need to send these people away. You know, there's, they're out here in the desert and there's no food. And what are we going to do? And uh, our Lord tells them, you know, have them sit on the, sit on the grass. And the evangelist tells us that the grass was green. Now, nobody on earth would think any, well, of course the grass is green. What other color would it be? Unless you're in Kentucky where it's blue, why would it be anything other than green? So you read right over it. But why is that important? How many of you here have been to the Holy Land? Okay. How many of you have been to the Holy Land sometime around very close to Passover? Okay. If you're ever traveling around, you would notice during that very brief little window around Passover, the grass is all green. The desert is blooming because that's the rainy season. Passover generally, of course, depends on where the moon is and the lunar cycle and all of that, but Passover generally falls right in connection with the rainy season. So the reason it's important to note that the grass is green when our Lord performs that miracle is because the green grass signifies this miracle happened right around the time of the Passover. And so what is our Lord doing? Here's the new Moses in the desert, feeding them with earthly bread before he proceeds into Jerusalem to sacrifice his body to be able to feed them with spiritual, his own self as bread. That's the connection between them. So I just offer that as one example for you as you're going through scripture. And I say start with the gospels. Uh, they, are the, uh, uh, they are the most important flowers in the garden of scripture, as fathers and doctors of the church have referenced them. Uh, so it's the little details. That's we're going to get into some of these little details here. So that you should begin to understand in a deeper way some of the personalities of uh, Holy Week and some of the relationships between them and how those relationships between individuals first begin with relationships interiorly. So, uh, Judas Iscariot uh, was born in the town of Cariot. Uh, actually, Iscariot means man of Cariot, K-E-R-I-O-T. Cariot uh, was a town in the south of Judah. 
Why is it important to know that? It's not important to your eternal salvation, but it's kind of important to your Catholic knowledge base because uh, Judas was from Judah and all the other apostles were Galileans. So there were 11 Galileans and one from Judah. Judeans were known at the time for being uh, great administrators. It was just sort of one of the things you grew up in. It was sort of the culture there. So, you know, where the temple was or Jerusalem, all of this is, you know, so anybody who was there was kind of very wise to the ways of the world. You just sort of grew up in that culture. Kind of be the difference between growing up in Dubuque and growing up in Manhattan. So, uh, if you grew up in Manhattan, it's pretty difficult, right, Bryant sisters? It's pretty difficult to grow up in Manhattan and sort of walk through the world naive. It's, you know, and, and not to mention with a rich vocabulary, we'll leave it at that. Um, so it's not at all, you know, so how did Judas wind up being the guy taking care of the money bag? Well, because that's the environment he grew up in. It's very good to take somebody who has a natural talent or a natural affinity for something and place them into that role. Unless, of course, they abuse that role. So, uh, you know, if you put somebody in a job that they either don't like or they don't have an affinity to or the natural talent set for, it becomes frustrating for you, irritating for them, and everybody, nobody's happy. So Judas, coming from Judah, more likely, uh, had a, a, a very, uh, you know, a good uh, administrative idea of how to do things, including how to pilfer the money. Um, something almost nobody realizes uh, is what the name, the word, the name Judas means. It actually come, it actually is the, uh, it was, first of all, it was an extraordinarily common name, extraordinarily common name going back a few hundred years because it uh, was sort of reminiscent of uh, Judas Maccabeus and his defeat of the pagans and all that business. And everything. So loads of parents named their children after Judas. Uh, that kind of stopped with Judas Iscariot. It didn't become such a popular name. Anybody here have a child they named Judas? Yeah, didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't think so. Um, his name means praise and it was, ironically enough, it meant praise as in the honor, giving honor to God. Uh, there's a little relationship there uh, that you can marry up between uh, Judas and Satan. Satan, before he fell, his name was Lucifer, which means light bearer. So all of these folks start off, or beings, start off all, you know, great names, sort of great destiny, and then something goes terribly wrong. Um, as far as we can tell, as recorded in sacred scripture, the root sin of Judas seemed to be avarice, greed. He may have had others, but this becomes a moment for us to do some self-reflection. It has long been thought in mystical and moral theology that each one of us could, should consider what our own individual root sin is. You don't have to do a show of hands on this, but just for you to consider <laughs> how many of us, and I say us, how many of us have gone into confession and then the next time we go to confession, we're repeating the same sins and then we go back to confession again and we're repeating the same sins and we just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Why is that? It's because the root sin has not been attacked. So whatever tree you're looking at, you know, an olive tree is going to continue to produce olives or an apple tree or a pear tree or whatever. The same fruit is going to keep coming from the same root. So it shouldn't be surprising at all that as you look at the history of ourselves or individuals, or in this case, Judas, who were reflecting on him and his relationship to our Lord, you know, the same fruit keeps coming. Well, of course the same fruit comes out. You know, a, a fig tree is not all of, a sudden, all of a sudden going to start producing oranges. So it's very important to kind of, for us, to increase in holiness 
to get a handle on what is our root sin. It's also important while we're understanding ourselves, looking at ourselves, to understand the very, very sad reality that we are fallen. Now, I know we all know that in some theoretical this, that, and the other way, and that nobody's going to object to it, and yeah, I sin, and blah, 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 blah. But you need to really think kind of deeply about this. Every single one of us is a, a victim and a bearer of concupiscence. It's that proclivity to sin, the attraction to sin. You look at something that you know intellectually. You know you should not cheat with her on your wife. You know that, and you do it anyway. Why is that? We live inside ourselves in this sort of cognitive dissonance, this struggle. So at the very beginning of our destiny, our eternal destiny, there it is sitting in kernel form, there's this desire to want to sin. Not all the time. Even Judas had remorse for what he did. But when it hits you in a wave, you want it. I want it. We want whatever that is. That's concupiscence. And it's almost impossible to resist, almost impossible to resist without a spiritual fortitude. That's why fortitude is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, the confirmation. You need strength, the whole bit. Well, how do you get that? Well, you just don't sort of wake up one day and be like, oh, it, it's a process. It, you have to keep building it. This is what you know, St. Paul says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Keep working it out keep building it up, keep going to confession, keep increasing in holiness, keep receiving the body and blood of our Lord, keep praying, keep reading scripture, keep up your devotional life, all of this, little by little, little by little, you have the, uh, you build up more and more, you build yourself more into a fortress, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and it's vivified by the life of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity in you. That's what being in a state of sanctifying grace is. Now, there are degrees of sanctifying grace. You know, not, every, not all sanctifying grace people walking around are all built the same. Some people, this is why self-importance is so, so important. It's so important. How do you stand in relation to yourself? What are the things, what are the things in the spiritual life that become the doorways or the fissures, the cracks into your soul that Satan can slip into? What are they? These are all things for you to just examine of your own accord as we're going through all of this. What are they? Well, we know what Judas's was, was avarice. Now, every one of us is psychologically wounded. Some people had a cat jump in the cradle with them and they're terrified for the rest of their lives, as a stupid example. But every single person ha brings into himself or herself these wounds that we acquire from walking around the world. Whether we're young, whether we're old, whether our spouse cheated on us and now we have to get divorced and I don't know how to start my life over, it doesn't matter what it is. It could have been a series of little things. It could be two or three big major things. They wound us. We said that in morning prayer this morning. Our wounds deliver us from our wounds. We all have these. And there's no point at all in denying it when you look into the mirror. We all have them, and we must admit that at times, careful how I word this here, they control us, or more theologically correct, we allow them to control us. And from those wounds, from that hurt, comes the rationalization. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious, 
Sometimes it's some little back and forth between the two. But from that comes this, you know, attraction to the sin. Concupiscence, the spiritual thing that's happening in our psyche, in our soul. Psyche, by the way, is just a Greek word for soul. The Latin word is anima. No one in the history of the world ever separated a person's soul from themselves until Freud came along. And when Freud came along and said, oh, psychology, as though that's something that happens out there. This is in our souls. This is who it is. Our psyches, that's what that is. So when people start talking about psychological damage as though it's something out there, which allows you to do whatever you want to do over here, that creates this complete ripping apart of the person. No, this is ours. My damaged psyche is mine. I have to look in the mirror and I have to accept that. Doesn't matter. Did you think your parents hated you when you were children? Did your, everybody at school beat you up? Did your, uh, every single girl you ever asked out on a date said you had a big nose? I don't know what it is. Doesn't matter what it was. We've all got them in the plural. We've all got them. They are weaknesses. They are weaknesses in the soul that Satan knows about because he has watched us since we were conceived. Since we were conceived, he watches the arrangement of the DNA. It may be that our Lord knitted us together in our mother's womb, but Satan wasn't away from that event. He didn't control it, he didn't actively participate in it in any way, but he certainly observed it. He watches the little one-and-a-half-year-old who snatches the toy away from his little sister and is like, hmm, avarice. He watches the, you know, seven- or eight-year-old who does whatever it is he's doing and goes, ah, lust. Ah, look at that little one over there wanting to show off all the time, always needing the attention, always needing some sort of reinforcement. I'll be using that against her when she's about 14. This is horrifying thinking that Satan catalogs us. Now, of course, our Lord does too, but got to understand here that our psychologies that are wounded become the feeder for concupiscence. Sin looks attractive because whatever that particular sin is, makes us feel better, it helps soothe, temporarily, soothe whatever that pain in the psyche is. So see, it's very easy to rationalize it, very easy to rationalize it. So as we look at all of this and understand, ah, this is how Satan operates. Okay, so we have a wonderful, sad, but very wonderful in the sense of much detail about Judas as an example. And as we go through Judas, Judas's stuff here, his failings, his eventual damnation, and yes, he was damned, um, Bishop Barron. Uh, <laughs> see, I, I knew I was going to not say something about bishops, and five minutes into it, I'm going on about bishops. Um, there is a... Uh, we have to spend our time thinking about ourselves in parallel to Judas. St. Alphonsus Liguori has a really deep and horrifying uh, observation about Judas. He said, uh, never forget that there are people in hell at this very moment who were at one time holier than you. And then he gives the example of Judas and says, Judas raised people from the dead. That's horrifying. 
That's why St. Alphonsus Liguori was an enormous promoter of praying for the grace of final perseverance. We say that prayer as part of our uh, apostolate prayers. Final perseverance. Let me jump, if I can, to a little bit for tomorrow for the Last Supper. So here are 12 apostles sitting around the table in the upper room, and our Lord says, one of you will betray me. Okay, one of them knew he was going to betray our Lord, but all of the rest, with the exception of St. John, and probably Peter, Peter probably entertained a doubt in his mind about whether he was the traitor or not, but at least the majority of the rest held out the possibility that they were actually going to be the traitor. They didn't say, who is it? They said, is it I? So there's this doubt about, you know, I love you, but when the push comes to the shove, how will I respond? That's the apostles. That's the apostles. Three years in person, in company with our blessed Lord, eating, visiting, this, that, the other, blah, blah, standing there watching Lazarus come forth. And one of them who had done that himself, along with all of the apostles, stood there and beheld that and still betrayed our Lord. Pray for the grace of final perseverance. That's number two on your list of what I'm leaving this retreat from with. Now let's expand a little bit on Judas and his relationship to our Lord. Judas was clearly wounded, like every single human being who has ever lived except our Blessed Mother, was wounded by original sin, there's damaged psychologies, life experiences that, you know, did them. You're not responsible for the life experience that damaged you. I don't know if any of you saw a movie, I guess it's, geez, I guess it was probably about 20 years ago or so now, but uh, it was called Goodwill Hunting, and it star, uh, starred uh, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. I think they won an Emmy, uh, an Oscar for it, or for the screenplay or something. Anyway, it was kind of their big debut into, you know, the madness of, uh, of Hollywood. Uh, Robin Williams, God rest his soul, was in it. He played the psychologist, and there's one very key scene very near the end. Matt Damon's a kid who's you know, just doesn't have hold of himself. You know, he, he can go out the, about the world and function like a functional alcoholic, and he does well, and people like him, and he's got all his stuff together and everything, but internally he's a mess. And he goes to Robin Williams. I, I, I don't remember why he had to go, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, he's there, and near the very end of the movie, Robin Williams looks at him and says, whatever the damage was, I don't remember. He goes, it's not your fault. And he's like, yeah, I know. He's like, no, 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 it's not your fault. And he keeps drilling him on that about a dozen times until Matt Damon breaks down and starts crying and finally accepts in his mind that, yeah, what happened to me was not my fault. I was the victim of whatever it was, but I have allowed that to now control every aspect of my life. And the damage that any of us, all of us, uh, experience from you know, early age, young adolescence, whatever it is, becomes kind of a controlling factor. And in our psychology, in our soul, and that's why we have to get mastery over our soul. And ultimately, no man can take mastery over, over his own soul without our Lord. Because what's going on inside your soul is being driven by the demonic. True, you didn't put yourself on that boat, but you have rowed out into the storm. That's true of every one of us. So 
but a lot of people don't want to go back and sort of revisit the pain and the this and the that and everything because they are somewhere in their psyche, they are accepting that they're to blame. No, they're not to blame for what happened, but they do have to have ownership over what they did with it. And this is where the correction can happen. This part of it will never be taken care of in this life. What happened, happened. But that is not destiny. That's not destiny. Your destiny is what our Lord has prepared for you in heaven. But you do have to grapple with these things. Whatever the hurt is, whatever the damage is, whatever the wounds are. So as we look at Judas, well, we don't know. I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't go into it. Scripture, the scriptures don't. We, all we know is that whatever his root sin is was avarice. He stole from the money bag. Apparently, he was very good at it, too. He stole from the money bag, and then what? Well, he uh, uh, was damned. Did something happen to him early? Of course it did. Or midway or something. You just don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to rob a bank. There's got to be something inside you that desires that. So whatever it was in Judas, just like every single one of us and every single person in the history of humanity has at least one thing inside them ticking, ticking. That sin or those sins look good because of this root sin or these root sins. Now, am I going to fight it? Am I going to try to understand it? Am I going to fight it? That's why we call it spiritual war. That spiritual war happens in here before it can happen out there. So, our Lord, certainly obviously from the first moment, well, from all eternity, but in his humanity, he sees Judas and he calls Judas. One of the great sort of mysteries of th that unfolds itself in Holy Week, but kind of throughout is, well, why would our Lord pick Judas in the first place? He knew he was going to betray him. He knew that he would hand him over to the Pharisees, who would hand him over to Pilate, who would hand him over to Golgotha. There's a very frightening line. We said it in the scripture reflections of the rosary this morning. When our Lord is standing there looking at Pilate, he condemns both Judas and Pilate in the same breath. That is why the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. You're sinning, Pilate, but the one who handed me over to you is guilty even more so. By the way, that's a little underline. I don't want to spend any time on apologetics, but that's a little underline for the proof right there of mortal sin, venial sin, and a difference in degree of sin. St. James says we, you know, some sins are deadly. I'm not speaking of those, I'm speaking of these, and he goes on and says some things about venial sins. But our Lord himself, out of his own lips, says there's a difference in sins. So, he knew that Judas would betray him. And as Holy Week begins to approach, our Lord knows what Judas is about to do. And he tells nobody he tells nobody. I'll just ask you for your own private consideration. Probably everybody in here has felt to one degree or another that they have been betrayed, you know, lied to, all that stuff, you know, by someone really close. It's really hard to get over. And what do you do when you discover that? You go to friends, and you say, I can't, you unburden yourself. I can't believe that Susie has done this to me. I didn't want to believe it. You go through all of that, you know, drama in your mind and your soul. You can't believe the degree of betrayal that has happened. And the closer the person is to you, or the closer they made themselves to you, the deeper that is, the more you feel it. And yet our Lord said nothing 
to anybody. Even at the Last Supper, he said nothing to anybody. The comment, it is he who dips his bread in the dish with me, he is the one who will betray me, that was said to Judas. It was our Lord's way, the first way of three ways over the next handful of hours, as kind of like a last final divine assault to try to save Judas, to lay out before him. That was the first one. He announces to the apostles at the Last Supper, he says, and there there is a very uh, pointed way the scriptures lay this out, the gospels lay this out. He says, it was the distress in his soul of our Lord. And in a great distress in his soul, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you is about to betray me. That was a warning shot to Judas. Judas knew what he was going to do on this day, that's obviously Holy Thursday, on Holy Wednesday, on Spy Wednesday, he already been to the Pharisees. He already had the 30 pieces of silver sitting in his sack. That's why you see many artists work. You always see Judas sitting there all looking all, you know, evilly and stuff, and he's got his hand on a bag of money. He had already betrayed Jesus. This, he was just looking for the moment to try to, you know, finish the deal. But he'd already betrayed him. So when our blessed Lord says to him, or says to them, truly I tell you, one of you is about to betray me, well, Judas knew it was him. The others didn't. So our Lord is telling Judas, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. Why do you bring somebody's sins out in front of them? See, although that happened publicly, or sorry, although that happened in a public forum, it was a private communication. So why does our blessed Lord do that? It's to present Judas's sins to him in the hope that he repents for his sake. Distress. That the God-man felt a distress in his heart, not because of what Judas was about to do that would, you know, result in his crucifixion, but because of the doom, the fate of Judas. That was the distress. This act so pained our Lord. This betrayal was so deep and so cutting and so disturbing of soul to our Lord that a thousand years earlier he was crying about it in the Psalms. He who ate my bread has raised his heel against me. That's the Holy Spirit writing that It was specifically about David and a betrayal that he had undergone. It was David's psalm. But as everything in the psalms and in the Old Testament, they're all pointing to the greater reality of our Lord. So great was that pain. And this is God. (laughs) This is God. And so great was the pain in his heart that in distress he cried out and echoed that psalm that outside of time, he had already bemoaned and lamented in all eternity. That's how intense the suffering of that betrayal was at Judas. And yet, his first moment, he simply announces to communicate privately to Judas, repent. Then, the second thing he does to try to give Judas every single last opportunity, is he offers him a morsel of bread. 
It is he who dips his bread in the plate with me, in the dish with me. In the ancient Near East, and this is even still somewhat true in some cultures today, uh, to actually take a little piece of food, and many of you may remember this from your wedding, to take a little piece of food and to place it into the mouth of somebody else is a great sign of affection. It's a great sign of affection. I love you. Sort of informally, these things are still kind of done between people who are deeply in love with each other in a romantic way, but even still on a a social level, on a cultural level, back in the day. Socrates talks about this feeding being somebody that you have great affection for. We're not told in the scriptures that our Lord fed anyone else, put a piece of bread into their mouth. And then that's our Lord sort of opening the door, saying, I'm still, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do, but I want to give you every single last possible opportunity that I, that I can possibly give him. Our Lord puts bread into his mouth, and St. John tells us that Satan entered in. Our Lord opened the door and Satan entered in. You think to yourself, how is this possible? The betrayal of Judas is a great horrifying mystery to us. We can understand bits and pieces of it because we all have some different types of aspects or touch on it, and every time we sin, we betray our Lord. I mean, we have all of these kinds of touchstones to the story, but it's so overwhelming. It's so mind-numbing that we really can't get our brains completely around it. When our sins are presented to us, however they come out, there's always only one of two reactions we have. The one reaction is that we sort of become shameful or shamed, which is the correct response. We become full of shame and remorse and we repent. We turn away from the sin. And then whatever we have to do to make up for the sin, you know, we go about our way doing it. Or somebody presents the sin to us and we become hardened in the sin. We now rush into it headlong. Well, that's kind of a function of where you are in the spiritual life. When Christ stands in front of somebody, there are only two possible reactions. Have mercy on me, a sinner, or I'm so much better than everybody else. And one goes away justified, and the other doesn't. Our Lord hid his pain about who it was from the apostles so effectively that they had no idea that it was Judas. They had no idea it was Judas never entered into their heads. St. John, again, tells us, when our Lord said to Judas, what you do, do quickly, and he went out, and it was night, he went out, and St. John, who's very good, by the way, at kind of stepping outside of the narrative of the story and giving you a little commentary, he does that routinely throughout his gospel. It's beautiful. Uh, He, uh, it's like, little running commentaries, like little footnotes. He says, uh, and the apostles thought that Jesus had sent him, uh, sent him out to go buy stuff for the feast. He's going out to go make the final arrangements with the Pharisees, and the apostles are completely clueless. They have no idea that's what's going on. Again, why is that important? Because our Lord keeps his pain to himself. Even there, he doesn't reveal it. You would think, I mean, you know, some great movie lines or or themes are built around the idea of exposing the traitor. 
you know, the, the, the wounded person, the betrayed person sets up an elaborate, you know, uh, storyline to expose the deed and, you know, show them off in front of everybody and all of that. And here, no, on a human level, everybody would have been, it's you. I don't think there's anybody in the room here who honestly wouldn't have said, yep, I'd be right after that guy. Everybody look at him. Here's his list. I've got the proof. Here's his cell phone pictures. Got it all. Our Lord just keeps it very collected. Third occasion for Judas to repent comes in the garden. Even there, he has brought with him uh, temple guards and soldiers as Roman soldiers, as uh, St. John tells us. Remember, a little side note here on Scripture, remember St. John knew uh, Annas and Caiaphas. So you've got to say, well, how was St. Peter inside the courtyard, you know, where he eventually did his betrayal, uh, his three denials? Uh, why was, how did he get inside the courtyard? John took him inside the courtyard. How did John get inside the courtyard? Because John knew the high priests, high priest and Annas and Caiaphas and some of the Sanhedrin. The, uh, uh, the very fact that John, St. John, tells us that the soldiers were there also. The others The other Gospels don't mention soldiers. They just say the cohort or the mob or the gang or some temple guards. Well, temple guards was one thing. Those were under the control of the Sanhedrin. The soldiers were part of the legion that was stationed in Jerusalem, that was bivouacked in Jerusalem. They had to, the the Sanhedrin had no control or authority over them. They would have had to have gone to Pilate or whoever the troop commander was, and say, we're going to go arrest this guy and this and that and everything else. So, again, one of those little between-the-line things, you read from John's Gospel that there was already a cooperation between the Sanhedrin, between the religious leaders and the government leaders. It already existed. That's why the Roman guards were also coming along with the temple guards, the Roman soldiers. So Judas walks up to... Uh, our Lord in this prearranged sign. We all know it's a kiss. And our Lord allowed him, allowed Judas to kiss him. He knew what was going to happen 30 seconds later. And he still allowed Judas to come to him and kiss him. And the first word out of the mouth of our Savior to Judas was friend. Friend. One last appeal, even in the act of the betrayal, because that was the sign, even in the very act of the betrayal itself, one last time the divine love tries to pull Judas back. And the same lips that our blessed Lord had placed that bread onto an hour, two hours, whatever, earlier, now turn around and kiss him and betray him. The depth of this betrayal was so bad that it is one of the very few times in Scripture where some being is actually named as being damned. When our Lord said at the Last Supper, after Judas left and went out into the night, and St. John makes the point, and it was dark. Why does he write that? See, this is one of those between-the-line things. Well, it's nighttime. Of course it's dark. He's not talking about the lack of the sun in the sky. And by the way, it wouldn't have been dark. It was a full moon. It was the Passover, bright full moon. There's very rarely clouds in Israel, very few. 
So the night sky would have been completely lit up by a full moon. But it was dark. Satan entered into him, and he went out into the night, and it was dark. That is a spiritual statement, not a physical reality, although it happens within a physical reality context. But the higher meaning there is a great spiritual context. And as soon as Judas walks out the door, our Lord says, the Son of Man is going the way Scripture has written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. He just walked out the door. Better for him had he never been born. Our Lord also called him at one point the uh, son of perdition. These are not exactly the things that you want the Son of God saying about you if you think you have a reasonable hope that you're saved. <laughs> and I want to have just one point, and I'll just tight a little bit over here, but I've, I've got to make this point because it's, it's germane to this. One of the most dangerous uh, problems in the church today is this it's not necessarily an out-and-out denial of hell, but it's kind of an operating denial that really nobody goes there. You know, maybe Hitler, and that's everybody's great big example. You know, Hitler's like Hitler's the only person who's in hell. And we know Judas is in hell. This baloney about uh, following a uh, uh, you know, this, this idea that, you know, we have a reasonable hope that all men are saved. A reasonable hope has to be based on a reason, and a reason has to be based on truth. We know with absolute certainty, because it came off the lips of our blessed Lord himself, that that man is in hell. Better for him had he never been born. I don't care if he did that 2,000 years ago and the world goes on for another 25,000 years and he was in purgatory the entire time. Eventually he would be saved, so it was good for him to have been born. Even if he had to suffer through 25,000 years of purgatory, like I probably will. Um, the, it's better that you'd been born if you are saved and you behold the beatific vision. That is a direct statement right off the blessed lips of our divine Savior himself. Better for him had he never been born. That creates a problem for, that phrase creates a problem for theologians, and I use small t and I put it in quotes, theologians who want to present this idea, oh, that everybody somehow, God's mercy is so great that no, he, if, and, you know, if, if somebody went to hell, he'd have been a failure. God would be a failure because he wanted everybody to be saved. He doesn't want everybody to be saved to the point where he overrides their free will. So this idea that everybody is saved, first of all, this heresy, that heresy that nobody goes to heaven, uh, hell, goes all the way back to a fourth century heretic named Origen. Origen is the most condemned heretic in the history of the Catholic Church. He was condemned as a heretic on 23 different occasions. That's a lot of heresy. His chief heresy was that every being is saved. That at the end of the end of the end, even Satan and all the demons are somehow like gone, hell goes and goes up to heaven. Because God's love is just so great that thing in Greek was called apokakastasis, and it was condemned by the church flat out. It, 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 that would deny five million other dogmas if that were true. It's not true. So a version of that came along from uh, a Protestant Lutheran theologian uh, by the name of Karl Barth, B-A-R-T-H, and he's the one who sort of proposed this, well, you know, everybody's so, God's so great and everything. Well, yeah, there is a hell. And yeah, Satan and the demons are in there. But we don't really know if there's any humans in there. And if there were humans in there, well, that would be a horrible thing because that means God would have failed because he came man to save everybody. So if he didn't save everybody, well, then his mission was a failure. And that's kind of the overview. And he gets into a bunch of perversions of theological uh, nuances to sort of support the position, which he actually doesn't. So uh, 
that Karl Barth was sort of a contemporary of a Jesuit Swiss theologian whose name was von Balthasar. And von Balthasar is the guy whose craziness is pushed by Bishop Barron left and right. And this is not, I'm not, this is not a thing about slamming whatever, Bishop Barron and all that stuff. It is idiocy to spiritual poison and mental intellectual idiocy to present in front of people souls that, you know, who need to struggle and fight in this world to achieve even a hope of salvation, to present to them that, yeah, you're saved. God's mercy is so great, you don't really have to do anything about it. You know, you just hop on the train. Maybe you don't have to hop on the train. They'll just put you on the train. It's just stupid. Our Lord said, pick up your cross and follow me. St. Paul, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You know, on the last day, I'll send out my angels. You'll gather the sheep and the goats and, you know, depart from me accursed into everlasting fire. We have these words off our blessed Lord's lips ourself. He said them personally. So they can't be untrue. Of course there are humans in hell. But you need to understand what von Balthasar's thing is here. It isn't just, and it's very deceptive, it is very deceptive of Bishop Barron to present just that sort of single line up there. We have a reasonable hope all men are saved because God's love is so great. I mean, you know, then we he just wants to do that. And he says in one of his recordings that uh, I think St. Thomas, this is, I'm quoting this because I've seen it a billion times, Bishop Barron, I think St. Thomas and St. Augustine have it wrong. I think Bishop, uh, or uh, von Balthasar has it right. That we have a reasonable hope all men are saved because God's mercy, blah, 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 and all this. Okay. He, he says that. You can look it up on YouTube. But we've played it a thousand times at Church Milton. Von Balthasar's theology of how he gets to that point, he wrote a book called Dare We Hope and the subtitle, That All Men Are Saved. And it's fine to sit and talk about that book, but there are two feeder books that went into that book. This book softens the language. This book masks the theology behind it. If you want to know what, where the theology, and again, I'm using that term in quotes with a small t and a little demonic symbol next to it, um, there's two books he wrote that are the underpinning of that book. They're big theological, you know, on and on and on, kind of like Karl Rahner works, and after like five seconds, your eyes glaze over and you reach for a marijuana because you can't read it anymore. <laughs> one of the names of the books, one of the books is named uh, You Crown the Year with Your Goodness. And the other book, whose name escapes me right now, in this other book, he says that Jesus' love for us, God's love for us is so great, so great, so overwhelming that when Jesus descended into hell, he is still there. And as every soul that would be damned comes to him, they sort of line up there and stare him in the face, face to face, and their hatred of God is overcome by his love of them, and eventually they go, okay, you win, and they go to heaven. That's his, that's what von Balthasar believes. It's written right there in his books. So uh, a little further note for you, at some point when you can, when you leave here, I would like, we go into great explanation on this. Great explanation on this. I'd like you to go to uh, our website, to Church Militant, and watch the video we did on this. We called it Massa, it's Latin, M-A-S-S-A, -S -S big, Damnata, D-A-M-N-A-T-A, -A -A, Massa Damnata, that the mass of humanity is damned. Every single father, saint, doctor of the church, all taught that. And origin, and then the link 1,500 years later to Karl Barth, to uh, von Balthasar, and now Barron. I, don't real, I certainly hope Barron doesn't realize exactly what it is he's pushing. 
If he's read the two feeder books into that, that's a problem. Our Lord is not in hell. Our Lord is standing at the glory of the right hand of the Father and waiting to come back and judge the living and the dead. But you have to understand what a pernicious, what a pernicious poison that is. It affects your entire view of your, like I said at the very beginning, relationship to Christ. God's love is unconditional, but salvation is not. Nor did our Lord ever say it isn't. He said just the opposite. Pick up your cross. You'll be judged by your deeds. One thing after another. Kept going and going and going. Tick, 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 tick. Yes, God wills that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Duh. But that's not where the story ends. And Judas is the prime example of that. Out of our Lord's own mouth, better for him had he never been born. And he ascribes the sin. If Pilate is guilty of a sin, and Caiaphas, who turns him over to Pilate, is guilty of the greater sin, and Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who turns him over to Caiaphas, is guilty of even greater sin, well, then what of the sin of Judas, who kind of knocked over the first domino? Better for him had he never been born. We're going to speak in the second talk uh, specifically. There's, much, there's, there's actually a lot more in Scripture about Judas than what most people realize. It's, you're, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I know the story, did this, and blah, blah. There's a lot more in Scripture. Where did Judas first betray our Lord? Uh, what are the similarities between Peter and Judas? There's all kinds of things about Judas in sacred Scripture in those Gospels, even back to the 40th Psalm a thousand years earlier. In one sense, as a big, great big kind of red warning flag, Judas is this big stake right smack right in the middle of the Catholic life. In the uh, uh, Latin uh, rituals for Good Friday, in the Latin rituals, it says specifically uh, uh, that uh, Judas was lost. That's in a prayer of the church. If you go to the Acts of the Apostles, where they replace Judas, Peter stands up and says, There's tw- you know, this was arranged so there'd be 12, uh, but we've lost one. St. Peter himself, who at that point is the head of the church, because this is after Pentecost, St. Peter himself, out of his own lips, says, Judas lost his apostleship. That's why Judas needed to be replaced, and everybody who came after them was a successor. The people who came after Peter, you know, Linus, Cletus, Clement, they weren't replacing him, they were succeeding him. Judas's apostleship was lost, and the Holy Spirit says in the Acts of the Apostles, he went to his, his own place. He lost complete relationship with our Lord. He lost complete relationship, and what is hell? It is the isolation from God. It's littered all over Scripture about Judas. Judas.